Hi, good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, Standardization and, and Large-Scale Manufacturing of Helper Plasmids for Viral Vector Production. It's brought to you in partnership with Aldevron. For those of you who don't know me, hi, I'm Nicola Ambler, your webinar host and editor of Facilitate Exchange, the digital content hub dedicated to advanced therapies and their commercialization. We are talking about helper plasmids and viral vector production today. And um, as we know, viral vectors are a huge bottleneck for our industry, um, from their manufacturing to, to challenging yields and much more. So I'd like to say a huge thank you before we begin to the panel for giving us your time today. Sharing experience and knowledge is so important for the growth of our industry and essential if we are going to ensure that advanced therapies become the new standard of care. Um, I want to give everyone a really quick reminder before we begin, this is an interactive session. All questions are very much encouraged. If you do want to submit something, um, please use the question function on the control panel in front of you, and we'll address these at the end of the presentation. Um, but without further ado, I'll hand straight over to your chair, James Brown, VP of Corporate Development at Aldevron. Thank you, James. Thanks, Nicole, and thanks a lot to everyone who's taking time to attend today. We really appreciate it. Um, it's truly an international group we have as panelists, and I think as attendees as well. Um, I'm greeting you from sunny Fargo, North Dakota, so we finally have good weather here, so I hope wherever you're at is, um, is good as well. I think it's a great time to be a part of gene therapy, and at Aldevron, it's always been our mission and vision um, from the starting of the company by our founders, Michael Chambers and John Ballantyne, to be a part of these transformative therapies that you all are developing and want to thank you for making us a part of it. Um, we just have some distinguished guests today. It's really um, a team effort, and we'll talk uh, a little bit more about these plasmids that we can make in general production if we can go to the next slide for the agenda. So I'll talk a little bit about plasmids and how they're used in gene therapy in the two different cases for recombinant AAV and lentivirus. And then I'm um, pleased to be joined by uh, Dr. Josh Grieger, one of our collaborators with Asclepios Biopharmaceutical, also known as AskBio. And um, instead of uh, Dr. Tom Payne, we have Dr. Ryan Cowood with us today from Oxford Genetics. Tom, unfortunately, was taken ill, so we wish him well. Um, and then they'll speak in more detail about the, these products and how they've been developed and um, how they're used within the different production options that um, you all have for recombinant AAV and lentivirus. And then we'll just talk briefly about the scalability of plasma production. We're pleased to be able to scale up to 300 liters and eventually 1,000 liters production to help support um, these transformative gene therapies. We can go to the next slide. So if we think about how generally how plasmid is used in gene therapy, um, there are several different modalities. One is direct injection of the actual DNA. It's typically complex with a nanoparticle or other agent for some uh, therapies use electroporation. There's a direct transfection of cells ex vivo Again, they're comp typically the DNA is complex with a nanoparticle or some sort of mechanism to move the DNA into the cells. As an in vivo raw material, um, this is where the plasma DNA is used to manufacture a viral vector that's directly administered to the patient. And then ex vivo raw material is a case where the um, viral vector is transfecting cells ex vivo and then re-administered into the body. But the fundamental use of plasmids in those two cases to manufacture the viral vector is very similar. <clears throat> we also see real growth in mRNA, and we manufacture the DNA template for mRNA production that can be administered directly to the patient, or in the case where there's transfection outside the body, um, a similar process of plasmid manufacture for mRNA production. And again, those modalities are typically have some electroporation, some way to get the mRNA in into the cells. So we go to the next slide. 
So today we're really going to focus on uh, these raw materials and talk about uh, AEV and lentiviral production and how these plasmids that we've developed with our partners really can enable uh, scalable manufacture of the plasmids as well as uh, reducing the cost and timeline for these raw materials in your use as a in the process of uh, viral vector production. You know, next slide. So for direct uh, gene therapy, our recombinant AV is used probably the most common vector these days. This, this just gives us a top level overview of uh, the process. So we're gonna take a bacterial cell bank to manufacture the plasma DNA, and we're gonna optimize that process and ensure that we get um, the best production and uh, the highest quality product out of that. And then that is combined with a mammalian cell bank to produce a recombinant AAV vector, which is then um, administered to the patient. So that's top level overview. The next slide um, goes into a little more detail. <clears throat> so we talked about steps um, one and two, getting that D DNA into the AAV. The AAV is then administered directly to the patient. It could go systemically, in, an, in the eye for ocular diseases, in the brain for neurological diseases, sometimes directly into the liver, a variety of uh, routes of administration. Then the AEV does what viruses do best, is deliver the DNA to the nucleus of the cell, which then results in expression of a protein that treats disease. Could be a re uh, receptor protein, could be a secreted protein. There are um, different options for how to treat these diseases. So if you go to the next slide. So the, the most common manufacturing method for um, recombinant AEV is triple transfection in uh, 293 cells. And in those cases, there are three plasmids that are needed. Um, the expression plasmid carries the transgene, which has the gene of interest flanked with ITRs. And, and Josh will talk a little bit more about um, the specifics of all of these. Um, there's two sort of packaging plasmids, uh, an ad helper and a rep cap. The rep cap is <clears throat> contains the genes to make the capsid of the AV, and, and depending on the serotype, these can vary. And um, many companies and academic institutions are developing new and novel uh, capsids. It's very exciting. So there's a lot of variety in in capsids these days. <laughs> and then the had the ad helper um, has adenoviral genes, which AAV requires in order to assemble itself. And then if you go to the next slide. So what we have done is looked at this, um, this set of plasmids and said, <clears throat> this helper is common to all AAV production. It doesn't, doesn't matter what AAV, what transgene you're trying to make, you always need this plasmid. So we've uh, partnered with AskBio, and we have an off-the-shelf product called PALDX80 which is exactly the sequence of PXX680 that Josh will talk about in a little bit with canamycin resistance. So what we've done here is, is offer this as an off-the-shelf product to enable faster and less expensive production of AAV. Next slide. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, uh, uh, Josh Grieger, to talk about um, AV transfection plasmids and how AxBio developed these plasmids and the exciting work they're doing on them, um, using them in manufacturing. Thanks, James. So uh, my name is uh, Josh Grieger. Um, I'm currently the Chief Technology Officer with uh, Sclepios Biopharmaceutical. And I've been working in the gene therapy space uh, for quite some time, about 17 years. Um, I got my doctorate degree in Jude Simulski's lab and have been, uh, uh, fortunately, been able to work in this space in North Carolina for uh, for many years. So let's go to the next slide. And so <clears throat> just a quick overview, AAV is a, a non-enveloped single-stranded virus. It has approximately about a 4.7 kb genome, so smaller genome. It's a dependovirus in the parvovirus family, and therefore it requires a helper virus to complete its life cycle, uh, hence um, the XX68 or endovirus helper plasmid. 
It's a 25 nanometer particle. There are various um, serotypes of AAV, and each serotype has its um, uh, tropic tropism, uh, as well as uh, uh, neutralizing antibodies specific to its serotype. It has not been associated with any human disease, and we've been able to show, as well as many others, that there's long-term gene expression in both animal models and now humans. Uh, next slide, please. So the AV genome is composed of a rep gene, a calf gene, and the rep gene, uh, you can see on the left-hand side, um, there's two large replication proteins and small, two small replication proteins that are necessary for replication of the, of the genome as well as packaging of the genome. And, you, and the inverted terminal repeats that are on the end in black uh, are 145 base pairs in length. And they're the cis-acting elements required for packaging, uh, and those are elements that are important uh, when we're making a recombinant genome. The capsid genes are uh, VP1, or one gene that makes three proteins, VP1, VP2, and VP3. With VP3 being the most abundant, um, it's considered the major subunit, and VP2 and VP1 are the minor subunits. VP1 is essential for infectivity as it has the, the nuclear localization sequences as well as the uh, phospholipase domain that's essential for making an infectious virus. Several years ago, the assembly activating protein was found um, buried within an alternate reading frame within the capsid gene, and that's essential for capsid formation. When, we're, when, we're, when we have engineered our uh, inverted terminal repeat cassettes for therapeutics, um, Jude Samalski obviously was the first to clone this into a plasma that would allow for this manipulation we can remove 96% of the wild type AV genome, just leaving the inverted terminal repeats as shown here on the right. And we can replace that with a promoter, transgene, poly A, and other cis acting elements, uh, intronic sequences, et cetera. And then um, you can also look at tissue specific promoters, um, optimized or small synthetic poly A's, and then codon optimization. Um, and codon optimization looks at you know, GC content, GCQ yeah. uh, removal, removal of cryptic sites, mRNA stability, um, human and other animal codon optimization. Next slide. And uh, Joe Rabinowitz in the small scale lab several years ago uh, published a paper on cross packaging of, of single item associated virus AV2 type genomes. Um, all the AAV stereotypes have um, evolved with their own inverted terminal repeats. The most divergent is AAV5. And the work that Joe Rabinowitz did was looking at how do we cross package an AAV2 vector cassette into the different capsids. And therefore, what this allowed to occur, what this allowed for was you have, you can have one TR, an AAV2 ITR, and cross package it into all the various serotypes. And so you didn't have to have um, a cassette with AV5 ITRs to package it on AV5, AV5 capsid and so on. And what he found was is he started to look at making chimerics of the AAV rep proteins that allowed for sufficient replication and packaging of, of the inverted terminal repeat uh, recombinant genome into the different capsids. And therefore, this allowed a, a streamlined approach for manufacturing these vectors only having one ITR plasmid, and then obviously having your XX680 or adenovirus helper plasmid, and then choosing one of your um, serotype capsids of interest based on the disease type you're trying to target. And you can see here, looking at a direct injection into the eye, that AV1, 2, and 3, um, they're based on that expression, are not as good in the eye as AV4 and AV5. In addition, there were some other modifications that were made to allow for decreased rep expression, which lead to increased capsid expression, which then led to higher production of, of AAV. And that was mutating the start site of, of replication gene 7868 from an ATG to an ACG. Um, that data was done prior to the work that was done here in this manuscript, but uh, um, that, that new start site mutation is in all of our expression cassettes currently. Next slide. And so work done by Zhao Zhao and uh, Jude Samalski uh, in the late 90s, um, they were aware of the fact that both herpes and adenoviruses 
were acquired to produce AAV. And therefore, they had identified the rep, the rep cap, and they've also had the inverted terminal repeat, and they would transfect those in and then co-infect with adenovirus. It was then later determined that the early genes of the adenovirus genome were essential for the, the functions needed to carry out the AAV life cycle. Um, so the advantage of transitioning those components onto a plasmid was the fact that now you were only going to produce AAV and not adenovirus and AAV. And so the genes that were essential um, are described here, the E1, E1A genes, E1A, E1B. Uh, those are integrated into our hex cell line and not included in the, the XX680 plasmid shown here on the right. And the other genes, the E4, E4 and E1B, uh, regulate gene expression of AV genes by aiding in RNA transport, as well as DNA replication and cell cycle arrest in the, in the G2S phase. And the E2A is the DNA binding protein that aids in activation of transcription and DNA replication. And then the VARNAs um, obviously prevent interferon-induced host cell shutoff mechanism of translation assisting in the initiation of AAV protein synthesis. And so the XX6A you see on the right is actually a depiction of, of, the, of the genes in the XX680. Um, the structural proteins that are, that are in this uh, cassette uh, are not expressed. Uh, the hexane assembly protein is not expressed. The fiber uh, protein is not expressed as well. Um, I know this is probably one of the questions that we'd be discussing by some of the viewers today. Uh, next slide. And so right around the time in 1998, uh, Zhao and Jude came up with the uh, the XX680 plasmid, um, and uh, Dirk Grimm and uh, Jürgen Kleinschmidt came up with a uh, dual uh, transfection where they, the rep cap genes were also placed on the, the large um, adenovirus helper. Um, and we stuck with the, uh, the triple transfection in our hands, it yields the best and allows for um, easier manipulation of the RepCat plasmid and growth because it's a smaller plasmid. But in the end, it's a triple transfection. All the three plasmids in specific ratios that have been optimized are transfected into our HEC293 cells. Uh, 48 to 72 hours later, the AAV viral vector production is uh, pretty much done, and then we go through a purification phase. And again, the advantage of using the plasmid over an adenovirus is uh, you don't have to worry about amplification of the adenovirus or removal of the adenovirus genome and or uh, proteins during the purification process. Go on to the next slide. And so we've taken our technology um, very far, you know, from the early 2000s, it was transfection of HEC293 cells on adherent plates, 15 centimeter plates, and transfecting hundreds or thousands of plates, scraping plates uh, to generate the, the vectors we needed for animal studies and then eventually you know, human clinical trials. And so during the development of not only the plasmids, but then also the manufacturing technology, um, we've been working with Aldebron uh, for over a decade on um, growing our plasmids and retention of the ITRs and all of our collaborators um, through UNC used Aldebron as well. So Aldebron obviously has a great reputation for growing these plasmids, retaining the, um, the large XX680 sequence without any deletions and then having, um, you know, generating, amplifying uh, ITR cassettes that retain a high uh, percentage of both ITRs in the plasmid. And so we, we utilize um, Aldebron to manufacture our, not only our research grade, but our GMP and GMP source plasmids. And we've transitioned to um, our Pro-10 cell line so we can grow in shaker flasks. And we've, over time, have transitioned from shake flasks to waves, to stir tanks, higher cell densities and larger scales. And, and having plasmids that are consistent, um, even between the serotypes, allows us to get consistent yields in our system. Um, as well as from our collaborators and any new chimera capsules that we develop. And one thing to note here is our technology has been transferred um, to both Baxter, now Takeda, and, and Pfizer through Bamboo Therapeutics. And, uh, and now we have a, a joint venture, Virogen, which is on the next slide. Um, and successful uh, technology transfer, sorry, um, 
success, successful technology transfer uh, for this manufacturing technology as well as the plasmids and the manufacturer have gone with these groups as well. And in terms of uh, consistent yields, um, this is just a depiction of a, of a three liter stir tank, a five liter wave bioreactor, a 50 liter sub, and a 250 liter sub of multiple serotypes that we've kind of put together looking at lysate yields prior to purification. And you can see that the consistency is there based on the consistency in the plasmas we use, the consistency of our manufacturing process, and uh, titering assays that uh, you get very reproducible AAV titers um, in the system using these plasmids. You can go to the next slide. And so um, viral gen vector core is our is S bios one of S bios joint ventures. Um, uh, we last year we did a technology transfer of manufacturing process as well as our analytical procedures. And uh, they've since uh, brought three GMP uh, suites online uh, with the ability to produce research grade GOP and GMP manufacturing um, from uh, 250 liter scale up to 50 liter scale. All the GMP suites. Uh, will be GMP certified in 2019, and all internal and external QC assays are qualified or validated. And Virogen also utilizes um, Aldebaran for all of their research grade and uh, GMP plasmid manufacturing for themselves as well as for clients. Um, they come with a high recommendation. Uh, because we see both success um, and consistency with manufacturing, uh, but we've also onboarded other uh, plasmid DNAs from clients uh, whether it's an ad helper or a serotype specific helper. And uh, the yields are um, usually lower uh, when we use plasmids from outside of our system. And clients will then um, tend to remove or go to those plasmids. It either has to do with you know manufacturing abilities uh, with their vendor or um, most likely the, the plasmid sequences that they're using to produce um, AAV. Thanks a lot, John. So, Thanks, James, again. <laughs> so if we can move to the to the next slide. So, um, thanks a lot, Josh. That was a, gr a great uh, description of the process there, and we, you know, really value our partnership with Ask Bio. It's been a long partnership, and. Um, uh, you know, we just love to be a small part of what you guys are doing and how you're uh, really improving the lives of patients. So this is a, a summary of the PLDX80, which is the PXX80 that um, was developed by Jude and co-workers. Um, and I think it has some real advantages that, that Josh mentioned. Um, it's got this 20 year history of success in clinical trials and, and certainly moving toward commercialization. One of the things that we worked with Ask Bio to enable is royalty-free use, even for commercial products. And I think it really shows Ask Bio's commitment to the industry and, and in general, wanting to get gene therapy to patients. <clears throat> this can replace, as Josh said, any other helper plasmid. So um, uh, I think that you know people do worry about you know do we have to do comparability studies if we're if we're already in clinical trials, I think that the impact is minimum with this, and I think the advantages outweigh any um, any additional work that one might do, regardless of what um, stage they are in development. Canamycin resistance is preferred over ampicillin, and um, these are uh, immediately available at research and clinical grade. So the advantage here is there's not a um, a lead time, there's not a manufacturing time. These are off the shelf and ready to ship. We offer small quantities free to use for research applications to get it in your hands so that you can um, see for yourself how it's performing. And as Josh mentioned, we really do have a cons reliable, consistent supply of this plasma. Next slide. So now we wanted to move um, over a little bit and talk about lentivirus. Um, which is typically used in, in cell therapies. Um, there are some direct uh, gene therapies with lentivirus, but the bulk is, is uh, by transducing cells. So again, we have a bacterial cell bank that we're gonna make the plasma DNA and optimize that process. Once again, we're um, transfecting into uh, the myelin cell bank to create the vector. Then typically we're 
um, transducing patient cells outside the body. This is a high-level overview of the next slide, a little more detail of um, extracting cells from the patient. Um, and of course, the, the uh, <clears throat> lentivirus is, is altered so they cannot reproduce. And then we have the gene of interest inserted into the virus and the cells um, are mixed with the virus to become genetically altered and then re-administered to the, to the patient in order to treat disease. Um, and the, one of the key elements here is that the lentivirus uh, delivered genome is integrated in the, into the chromosome of the cell, so any, any daughter cells will retain that uh, modification. Next slide, please. So the similar process for lentivirus, the most common is um, transfection, again, in 293 cells. In these cases, one needs four plasmids. So the transgene plasma itself is going to carry the gene of interest and express, the, express that gene. And then there are packaging plasmids, the VSVG, GAG, PUL, and REV, um, that are used um, in all uh, manufacture of lentivirus for, for the so-called third generation um, system. So if we go to the next slide. So what we um, did in, in collaboration with um, Oxford Genetics is, you know, we, we looked at um, what we were manufacturing for clients similar to uh, the case of AV and said, you know, these uh, plasmids are common to all recombinant lenti production. Um, so we can take these and manufacture these at scale, have them off the shelf available for clients. Um, we've also worked with Oxford Genetics to enable our clients to use the expression plasmid uh, that they have developed uh, and um, clients can clone their gene of interest into that. And that, of course, is a custom manufacturer, um, but it really provides some advantages when used with the other uh, lenti packaging plasmids to have very high titer, uh, high quality lentiviral production. So we go to the next slide. So again, we have uh, Dr. Ryan Kawa, the CEO of uh, Oxford Genetics, uh, in for uh, Dr. Tom Payne. So we're very excited to have this relationship with Oxford Genetics and wanted to turn it over to, um, to Ryan to talk a little bit more in detail about um, the lenti plasmids for viral vector manufacture. Thank you, James, uh, and I hope everybody can, can hear me okay. Uh, unfortunately, Tom Payne and those of you who dialed in to listen to Tom, I apologize. Unfortunately, he lost his voice yesterday, uh, so, so I've had to step in uh, in his stead. So hopefully I'll, I'll do the slides justice. Um, so firstly, just to start off by saying I'm really pleased with the, this collaboration uh, with Aldebron. I think as, as all of you um, in the webinar will recognize, Aldebron have played an integral part in the expansion of gene therapy uh, over the last 20 plus years. So uh, I'm really excited about uh, this collaboration. And in terms of a bit of background about Oxygenetics, uh, so as a company, uh, I founded it back in, in 2011. And really, the vision at the time um, was to try and bring a level of standardization to uh, molecular biology. And by that, I mean, rather than obtaining various pieces of DNA from various different sources, try to build them in a consistent manner um, and link them together in a modular fashion in a way that you would be able to predict the biological outcome um, better than you perhaps would by just joining them uh, together uh, from random sources. So uh, we started on that journey back in 2011, and we relatively rapidly uh, realized that an area that would be very uh, important for us to develop um, very good plasmids in would be in, in viral vectors. Uh, and the lentiviral vector uh, system that we will be discussing today is something that's quite taken us, uh, well, it took us about three years to develop, but we started developing it about um, five or six years ago. Um, the company itself is now about 85 people. We've got a, a US subsidiary over on, on the East Coast. Um, and as a, in terms of what the business does, uh, we, we basically develop technologies and solutions, and sometimes that's a custom service, uh, trying to license those technologies out to get them into the wider market. And, and for us, this partnership with Aldevron is just an example of that. I mean, the, it's, a, it's a fantastic way for us to get uh, our lenti plasmas out into the market and get um, people ho hopefully experiencing the benefits. Um, the company itself has three main areas. By far the largest is gene therapy, uh, and most of what we are doing in that uh, part of our business is developing solutions for the manufacture of gene therapy. We also work in antibody discovery as well as CRISPR engineering, but as I say, by, by far the largest section uh, is gene therapy. So, if we go have the next slide. 
So in terms of uh, the rentavile vectors, uh, as we had a similar overview to, to AV, uh, there are, you know, contrary to, to AV, they're an envelope vector derived uh, originally from HIV-1 uh, genome. Um, if you were to use the wild type life protein of HIV-1, you would have fairly restricted tropism in terms of the, uh, the cells that you would be able to infect. So the most common change that's made and one of the earliest changes that were made to the lentiviral vector uh, technology was to replace that endogenous glycoprotein uh, with the, the glycoprotein from VSVG uh, or from VSV. Uh, the glycoprotein is called G. Um, and that enables the vectors to have a very broad infectious tropism across uh, a wide range of, of, of cell types. Um, in terms of the, the genome, again, very different to AAV, uh, this is an RNA genome with actually large portions of the, the viral genome that has to retain uh, within it, more than uh, in terms of percentage than you would find it in AAV. Um, but it does have a large capacity uh, to, to package exogenous DNA, so somewhere in the region of, of 7 to 8 kilobases. Uh, although as you start to increase that, certainly the, the amount of virus and the of titan that you get um, starts to tail off quite dramatically. It's uh, the viral vector, contrary to retroviral vectors, uh, the lentiviral vector system can infect both dividing and non-dividing cells, so a significant advantage there. It stably integrates the, the uh, DNA into the, the host chromosome, that's a significant advantage in the instance where the cells that you introduce will go on to divide uh, within the host. Um, most of the, the, the gene therapy indications that AAV is being used for, uh, that's not the case, um, because the cells are, uh, are generally quiescent. Um, obviously, in the case of something like CAR T, um, the cells will go on to divide the patient significantly, and for that reason, the antiviral vector is really the only vector of choice uh, in that setting. Um, just a general comment, I suppose, is that the integration generally occurs at sites of, of high transcriptional activity. That's obviously beneficial in terms of being able to get your transgene to, to express well within uh, the host cells. Next slide, please. Um, so just a bit of a background to the, the viral vector system itself. So on the left, the top left, we have um, a HIV-1 uh, lentiviral genome, and you can see there's a number of different accessory proteins. These are the ones in, in orange. Um, and the, the very early versions of, of creating lentiviral vectors really sort of gutted the system, and but, but still retained a lot of these accessory proteins, and also uh, used the genes from HIV-1 in, in their native configuration. And what you see on the right is what we might call our third generation packaging system, and, and that's not something that's unique to Oxford Genetics, it's something that, that was established uh, over many years. Um, and it has a significant number of advantages in comparison to uh, the, the first and second generations uh, that came before it. Um, some of those advantages are essentially that there is very little homology between the lentiviral vector itself and the genes that are used for the packaging, which is in this case, as you can see, is GAGPOL with uh, DSVG. Um, and by splitting them onto separate plasmas, you also gain an additional safety advantage by reducing recombination and reducing read through from one cassette into the other. Um, and so, and, and the other advantage of this particular system that's shown up here is that it's a self inactivating system. So the five prime uh, LTR essentially, uh, the promoter section is deleted when it's reverse transcribed and goes into the host chromosome, which pre prevents or, uh, or should, in theory, uh, completely obliterate any um, enhancer activity that that promoter might have on adjacent genes. Uh, toxicity was experienced in very early retroviral clinical trials. So, so a considerably safer system uh, than any of the, the, the previous systems. In terms of the envelope, as I've, as I've alluded to, uh, it's from, from particular, particular thermotitis virus. It has a very broad tropism. You can infect uh, most cell types with it. Um, the GAG and POL are from uh, HIV-1 and provide essentially all of the internal proteins uh, that are required uh, for the structure of the particle as well as its reverse transcription. Uh, and the REV protein is, is required for the shuttling of the mRNA genome from the uh, nucleus into the cytoplasm to be packaged into the, the viral particle. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, oh, yeah, that's it. Sorry, yeah. Um, so in terms of what we've been doing at Oxygenetics, so we looked at the, the system as it as it was um, when we started this work about five years ago, and we noticed that there was quite a lot of homology still between the different components of the system. So in in some instances, some of the systems that we were seeing uh, contained five copies of the CMV promoter. They were using three or four copies of the same untranslated region, uh, and generally all four copies of the same polyadenylation signal as well. And whilst a lot of work had been done to reduce the chances of recombination, we looked at it and thought, well, is there a way that we can try and, try and reduce this even further? And in simultaneously in doing that, try and get any improvements uh, in, in yield. And so uh, we, we initially started basically working from the left and going to the right. Um, so we did a, a large promoter screen, uh, which I think we screened about 5,500 
promoters in a raid format um, to try and find recompetent promoters, which we had created, that would drive transgender expression at uh, higher levels. Uh, and so most of the promoters that you will see between um, in our lens viral vector system will not be in the public domain, but you will be able to, look when you uh, see the sequences when working with Aldevron, you'll see that they're different from each other and that provides a significant uh, or, or an additional uh, safety advantage. All of the vectors uh, also use our backbone, which again, we recently resynthesized from scratch, has been redesigned from scratch. Um, it has a number of the benefits within it in the sense that we've reduced uh, any of the, there's no polydenylation signals in the backbone, there's no uh, TATA signals, there's no ATGs, there's, there's no splice signals. Essentially, the backbone is devoid of anything other than what the backbone uh, should be. Um, and it also has panamycin resistance, which obviously is a regulatory advantage. The, as James alluded to, there's the three consistent parts of the, of the vector system, the BREV, the glycoprotein, and the gag pole. And then there's the genome uh, vector, which is something that through Aldevron, you can acquire that uh, vector and have the ability to modify it and then take it back to Aldevron uh, for manufacture. Um, it's a self-inactivating uh, viral vector system, uh, very similar to those that you would have come across uh, you know, in, in previous vector systems uh, and gives very good yields uh, as well. Um, and so that's a, a general overview of the system that we've used. Again, the polydenylation signals uh, at the end will be different. And this is, this is part of a, uh, a series of, of experiments that we did over a couple of years, basically to figure out which um, promoters, UTRs, polyadenylation signals work well together. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is some of the results. Uh, and you know, I'd like to say that every construct that we ever made uh, in this in this program worked. Obviously, the majority uh, didn't. But what we found was that by combining specific uh, specific um, promoters with specific ETRs and specific polydenylation signals, um, and then combining these vectors at different stoichiometries, eventually we were able to come up with um, a vector system which outperforms all commercially available equivalents that, that you can buy um, you know, from from competing systems. We then validated that both in adherence as well as in suspension. In the suspension context, um, this is uh, a serum-free HEC293 um, based system using PEI, so fairly standard production process, but very scalable and something very similar to what most people would use uh, in their manufacturing process. I believe this is in a shake flask. We have similar yields uh, in bioreactors as well, but we only go up to about two liters uh, at Optogenetics. Uh, we don't go up to the, <laughs> sadly, up to the 250 liters as we saw in, uh, in Josh's slides. Um, but we get reproducible results, uh, whether we're scaling from a small shape flask all the way up to two liters. So um, we, we're very pleased with, with how the system is, is operating. Next slide, please. And so this is just a little bit of background to what we're doing at, at Oxford Genetics and maybe part of our longer term vision. And you know, the, the left system uh, that you see there is the transit system, which is obviously what we've been talking about today. And by and large, I suspect for the foreseeable future, most customers that will be going into uh, phase one, probably phase two, and potentially even phase three, clinical trials will be using this type of approach. Obviously, as the industry migrates over the next 15 to 20 years, what we're expecting is that people will start to move towards a, a more monoclonal type model. Um, but I think in the short term, what we'll see is a, is a sort of halfway house uh, towards packaging cell lines, which many of you who are listening say will be familiar with this concept, where some parts of the system are integrated and you still transfection your genome. And then potentially in the future, uh, you could uh, envisage moving towards producer cell lines. I would say that's, that's uh, a longer vision. Uh, the parts of the viral system are very toxic. Um, and so for now, I think uh, platforms are, are certain. Yeah. Next slide, please. And so just to mention some of the work that we've simultaneously been doing on, on HEC293 um, cell line development, because what we, we envisage here is being able to provide a solution both for the viral vector piece uh, as well as the cell line that, that goes alongside that. Um, so we have our own uh, GMP, HEC293 uh, GMP bank, um, and what we've subsequently done is then created derivatives of that uh, GMP bank, which includes uh, a GMP clonal uh, line that we've created which we isolated because it had improved um, productivity for both AAV and also for Lenti. Uh, so we've licensed that cell line out to multiple parties now for both Lenti viral and, and uh, AAV manufacture. And then we're subsequently going through this iterative process over the next uh, multiple years of modifying those lines to uh, create both packaging and reduced cell lines. But um, something that's perhaps more relevant for this call is that we are frequently um, finding customers going to Aldevron to require uh, the plasmas that they need for, for their manufacture but then they don't necessarily have a source of that 293 cell line as well. And, and we're obviously doing a lot of partnerships um, on that side as well. Next slide, please. 
Uh, and so this is really just what I suppose I was just reiterating what I was just saying. Uh, so on the left side, the transient system as we have it right now is currently available. It's something that um, that you know, we've been in discussions with Aldevra on about that as well. And the fact that you know, the, the plasmids obviously work very well and have been fully validated in our clonal system. But as we move towards the, the next, uh, well, as we have optimistic timelines on there, but certainly in the R&D phases for the rest of this year, this is going to be a major push for us. Um, but I suspect it will take longer to come to market. But this is our, our longer term vision. Um, but certainly, if, if there are customers on the, the call who, who will be using uh, the systems, the viral vector systems through Aldevron, but have a need for cell lines, then certainly they, they can get in touch with us. So in terms of the advantages of the, the plasma system, um, so the, the plasma, as I say, have been optimized in a number of different ways, um, really to try and improve safety uh, as a primary concern, but secondly, to try and improve yields as well. Um, there are significant advantages, primarily in terms of yield, but also plasma sizes are smaller. And as we understand the feedback we're getting from Aldevron, the plasmids are behaving very well uh, in their hands. You can couple those plasmids with the cell line systems which we've been developing to allow, um, with Aldevron's capabilities and the cell lines that we've got, a solution to allow our clients to, to generate Lenti relatively uh, hassle-free. Um, and the other part of what we can provide for the company is that you know, using those plasmids that Aldevron can provide, in our cell lines, we can also do a certain level uh, of process development if customers um, require that, if they're at a very, very early stage. I think that's the last slide. Thanks a lot, Ryan. That was a, a great overview, and um, congratulations to Oxford Genetics for the progress that you're making in uh, in these Thanks, areas and, and that you made with the plasmids. So uh, this, uh, again, uh, summarized the PLD Lenti system is the, the Oxford Genetics optimized uh, plasmids, as Ryan discussed, the codon optimized, really, minimization of these various um, um, aspects that uh, can cause issues. Um, and again, um, showing uh, the commitment of Oxford Genetics to the field, these are available royalty-free even for commercial products. So we can manufacture these um, for any stage of development. And they can replace any existing third-generation lengthy viral plasmid system. So if there, if there are other systems in use out there, I think that the um, whatever minimal amount of effort, depending on your uh, phase of development, is required to move, I think it's well worth it when you consider the advantages that these bring. They're immediately available for research and clinical use, so off the shelf for um, uh, GMP production of lentivirus, um, the, the packaging plasmids can ship next day. Um, and they're free to use for research applications, so we have small quantities that we definitely would like people to, to try out in their own laboratory to, to prove to themselves that these are um, really good products and, and have advantages over other products. <clears throat> we, as uh, Ryan mentioned, we actually have, have made these at large scale. They, they're very well um, characterized and, and good yield. So you have a consistent, reliable supply of these plasmids. And then this, and for the lentis, we have the expression backbone uh, available for for use, and we can work with um, Oxford Genetics or any other um, group to quite easily um, clone in your gene of interest. Next slide, please. So uh, about a year ago, we opened the facility that I'm now sitting in in Fargo, North Dakota. It's a 70,000 square foot um, building that has 17,000 square feet of clean room space for uh, mainly for plasma DNA production, but we also manufacture enzymes, particularly gene editing enzymes, and also mRNA. So this is a photo of our 300-liter React uh, fermenter uh, that has been online for quite a few months and, and been producing plasmids, including the PLDX80 plasmid. Um, this graph just shows that we get good scalability with this system. So we have two showing two runs of 30-liter scale and a 300 liter scale. Um, so it's been very good um, scalability and we're able to really provide clients with what they need um, at the proper scales. And we're able to make these plasmids, these uh, standardized plasmids at scale, really drive down the cost and timeline. <clears throat> and we recently announced um, a thousand liter capacity at our uh, site in Madison, Wisconsin. So we have uh, protein development there as well. So this greatly expands our um, our capabilities as far as uh, the scale that we can produce these at and, and is really going to have a profound positive effect uh, on our clients and, and their 
ability to use these plasmids and get them when they need them at, um, at appropriate, affordable prices. So next slide. I guess we're coming up on our 45 minutes. Wanted to thank everyone for um, for attending, and I hope you all found this useful. And I'll turn it over to um, our organizer, Nicola. Hi, thanks, James. Thanks, everyone. Um, a lot of information to, um, to take in there. Um, and thank you very much for sharing that, and lots of great prospects for, for the future in terms of what um, everyone seems to be focusing on. So really good news. Um, we've got a few questions here, um, so I'll kick off with those. And if anyone has any questions uh, that come up during this Q&A portion, feel free to, um, to submit them. Um, I'll start with um, this one. Uh, this was actually submitted while Ryan was talking. Ryan, I don't know if you want to take take this first, but um, the question about uh, PLD80. Um, why have you kept the fiber hexan regions? Other common helper plasmids are um, 6 kb plus smaller because they don't have this region. So I think that's probably one uh, for Josh because that's an AAV that's for Josh. Uh, vector, I believe. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's a good question. Um, we have. Um, we're looking at obviously removing those. Um, we've compared um, vector yields um, with the helper plasmas that are smaller that that do not code for the um, those uh, structural proteins, and um, we've seen routinely higher yields with our XX680. Uh, at the moment, we don't know why that is. We don't know if it's um, um, if it's if it's those sequences, even though they're not expressed, but those are things that we need to look into. Um, but we have compared our, our uh, adenovirus helper plasmid and subbing it out for those that are commonly used without those pro without those genes encoded. And uh, we do see higher yields consistently with ours. And so we haven't manipulated it yet or have gone through and removed sequences to see which ones seem to impact that. Great. Um, I don't know if anyone else has got anything to, to add to that. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Josh. I think that's generally what we find in the field as well. Um, that uh, you know the, the the plasma just performs well in, in lots of different groups' hands, and I think there's certainly an opportunity to look at that. And, and we're just had conversations recently with um, with Josh and his team about that. Um, something you know we're we're going to look at, but I think you know the the sort of risk benefit there. Um, is clearly on the side of um, the existing um, PLDX80 as it is now, but we're all, always looking to improve. And just from from my side at Oxygenetics, we've we've also done um, a fair amount of work on AUV, and rather confusingly, we've also found uh, very similar results. So <laughs> just it helps uh, just to verify what Josh is saying. We've we've seen similar observations ourselves. When we remove it, the yield seems to go lower, and we're not quite sure why yet. Um, there's another um, AAV-related question. Um, it asks, do you validate the AAV helper plasmid release assays per ICH guidance for both GMP source and GMP, or is the client able to request specifically and contract the additional cost for validation per ICH? Yes, um, we offer a, a panel of um, standard release assays with standard specifications, and we can definitely provide that to anyone uh, on request. Um, we do have a stability study that follows the the, the, the we have for the um, for the plasmid. I think for PLDX80, we're coming on a, a year for that, um, so that is consistent with ICH, and certainly. Um, we provide other documentation around the manufacturing of the plasmid as well. Um, these <clears throat> assays are all qualified. We have a GMP QC lab that, that does all of our GMP and GMP source release testing there. Um, it's really, I think, a world-class uh, quality control laboratory with you know, qualified assays and, and such. But um, in cases where you know, individual clients may want um, assays that are outside the norm or have additional work, we can certainly work with clients to do that. But at least to this point, um, what we have manufactured has been sufficient for, you know, through commercial production. So we're confident that we can meet those requirements. 
Great. A um, couple more coming in. Um, for ex vivo raw material application, what plasmid grade do you recommend for a phase one trial? And does it matter if it's AMP or CAN resistant? Um, for so that would be for the lentiviral for ex vivo. Is that I'm, I'm assuming that's the case. Um, I think that you know ultimately these decisions are you know between you know with the sponsor and working with regulatory agencies. Um, I think that for what we've seen is for early phase um, lentiviral production, uh, GMP source is a is a very attractive and a good all good option for for clients that are making lentiviral vectors um, that are going to be used in in clinical trials and in, in transduced cells administered to patients. As you move later in phases and and commercial, I think that um, some clients have opted to move to GMP, and we can certainly support that, and we'll support that with these um, with these vectors. Uh, and depending on the applications and, and the perspective, um, I think the GMP source may be sufficient as well. So I think between those two those two grades, you have a couple uh, very viable options. Um, and certainly for the early phases, uh, GMP source I think is is a, um, a plausible and, and and probably better option given the cost and timeline. Thank you. Um, if no one has it, does anyone have anything else to add? If not, I can. Um, there's a couple of other questions to get through. On as well. the, just on the the AMP and CAN, um, I mean, yeah. we we as a company at Oxygenetics don't have a huge amount of, of contact with regulators. What we do have is, uh, is a huge amount of contact with with companies who are developing therapeutics, and and by and large, there is a general um, you know, perception that canamycin is is uh, much more acceptable to the regulators. Than AMP. I wouldn't be in a position to agree whether AMP was unacceptable, but I, I would certainly say that canamycin is preferable. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, I apologize. I, I missed that part of the question. I, I wholeheartedly agree for both systems. Um, I think, you know, for all of these um, uh, clients, uh, I think are well served to move to canamycin as, as quickly as possible. Um, next question um, is a quick one. When will the lenti helper plasmids be available for clinical trial use? Um, in, in brackets, they refer to ex vivo raw material. Right. So we have um, uh, the the GMP source uh, PLD lentis are almost released. We expect them um, released in, within the next month, certainly this summer. So I think those are uh, those will be available very quickly here, and uh, the manufacturing has been finished, and we're doing the the quality control assays and the, and the quality assurance review and release of those. So we expect them very soon. So uh, place your orders now, so to speak. Um, so, um, you know, we'd be happy to talk to um, any clients about more specifics on that, but those are almost done. Thank you. Um, and then two, we've got two, three left, um, and we've got a bit of time, so I'll carry on. Um, are Oxford Genetics lentiviral plasmids license free for CROs that provide gene synthesis and cloning services? Yeah, this is James again. So certainly, um, part of the um, you know the, the the license for the expression plasmid, as as, as Ryan discussed, the process you can um, have those you know clone in your transgene and your promoter and, and those sorts of things um, with any third party. It doesn't have to be with, with Oxford Genetics necessarily, although, you know, I would, I would argue they're the experts on it and, and we've had cases where um, we've collaborated with them on sort of advice and strategy and then the, the client has gone with some other provider that they're comfortable with for actually doing the cloning and um, any gene synthesis as well. So I think that uh, the clients have options for for those, um, uh, you know, that that aren't that are don't run afoul of any licensing at all. 
Yeah, and, and just to add um, from our perspective, the the, the way in, in which this works with, with Aldevron is obviously that uh, customers can can buy the um, the genome uh, expression plasmid from Aldevron, um, modify it, and then uh, ask Aldevron to, to manufacture it uh, for them on their behalf. Um, and the what is excluded is is if somebody were to acquire that vector and then offer obviously a commercial service uh, using that vector. Um, either to make lentiviral particles uh, as, as a service and no longer using you know, in that process uh, or without a license from us, um, or if somebody wanted to acquire that vector and then use it as a general cloning service, um, you use that vector in a general cloning service, then, then that would be prohibited. Um, but obviously what we want is the innovators in the field to acquire the vector and be able to clone their genes in and get them to, to clone it as soon as possible. Great, thank you. Um, one more question we have. From an innovator perspective, what is your posture regarding dual versus sole sourcing of PDNA? This James, so I think, um, you know, I'll just weigh in on that and turn over. You know, we obviously understand that clients need to protect their supply chain uh, as much as possible, um, but I think we have, you know, um, dual facilities now and um, you know uh, uh, a state-of-the-art manufacturing facility that we can um, you know supply plasma needs for our clients certainly uh, solely if, if that's an option uh, but, but if not it's the main supplier so we certainly understand that and, and want to work with clients to to do what we can to meet their needs and I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleagues for any other comments From a, no, from a dual source. Sorry, go. Sorry, Karen, Josh. So, um, you know, that's one thing that, that that we've discussed internally is having dual source. Um, but the the reason we have the reason to this point we haven't moved forward with it is uh, um, the consistency that we get with Aldebaran, uh, as well as uh, you know working through um, retention of the ITRs, retention of um, of uh, uh, XXX80 sequences since it is a larger plasmid. Uh, we, we have we have had clients in the past go with other vendors and um, where XXX80 was truncated um, and a majority of the ITR was um, was lost. Um, and so it, would take, it takes a lot of time up front to, to walk through the technology with some of the plasma manufacturers because they're not familiar with, some of them are familiar with large plasmids as well as um, inverted terminal repeat amplification. It can be worked out. Um, it is something that we are discussing, um, but uh, we have not had any issues utilizing Aldevron uh, to meet all of our manufacturing needs. And a lot of that is also being proactive on our end, so mapping out good timelines, understanding that a master cell bank needs to be established, that kind of takes a period of time to establish that, followed by um, manufacturing of the plasma DNA. So um, if you're reactive, um, you feel the pressure of having a second source. If you're proactive, um, uh, manufacturing of the plasma DNA can be done in sufficient amount of time prior to your manufacturing. And then also having XX680 um, uh, available um, at Aldebaran off the shelf um, uh, may, is, a, is a major help and advantage. Great. Um, we've got a we've got a last question that's just come in. Um, for quality control of plasmid products, is full sequencing expected? Yeah, this is James. Um, yeah, I think it is, especially at the uh, GMP source and GMP level. So full sequencing is uh, a standard uh, assay, release assay for us, and verification of the sequence for, um, you know, certainly for the starting material uh, that, we re that we received. And in the case of, um, the inventory plasmids, the C of A provides the full, full sequence analysis. Great. Um, I don't know if anyone's got anything to add to that. We've got one final question before we wrap up. Um, with um, with drugs like Luxterna and the new Avexis uh, approved uh, gene therapy, requiring the doses require huge amounts of um, viral vector. Does the does the market have enough
capacity if these drugs reach say 50% or 100% um, market penetrance? So what's the what's the sort of future hold for when more and more of these therapies are approved? I can this James I can comment from a plasma perspective and um, yeah I think it's there is a lot of pressure on the industry to uh, create capacity and. Um, you know, we built this uh, facility that we have now. We have expansion plans. Um, we expanded our uh, fermentation capacity a thousand liters at uh, at our Madison facility. So, you know, we're gearing up to to meet these needs uh, going forward, and and we believe that we can um, with the plasma that's needed to manufacture the, the viral vectors. So, um, it's you know, these are good problems to have, so to speak, with you when you have success like this. And the demand goes up. Um, it's a challenge, but it's a great challenge to have because it means that these things are really making a difference to patients. And for um, bio vector production, I'll turn it over to my colleagues um, to comment. No, that is a that is a good a good question. And uh, as AAV is moving more towards commercial um, and and requiring, for, especially for some of the muscular dystrophies, uh, a lot of vector, you know, 1 to 3, 14 VG per kg. That's a lot of virus, um, not only to produce, but then also um, having a raw material um, available to produce that consistently. And so those are those are problems that we need to solve. Um, and one of those is expansion, like Aldebaran is doing. And others might be going back to having a secondary supplier that can produce a uh, you know, a plasmid at the same quality um, that Aldebaran manufactures. Um, but at some point, um, not only AV manufacturing has to expand or the processes have to get more efficient, um, uh, but plasma manufacturing also um, in terms of capacity, but then also yield. Some process development is going to have to go in and into that as well, increase yield per volume as well. Fantastic. Thank you for your um, input, everyone. I think we are about ready to, to wrap it up there. Um, unless uh, James or um, Ryan or Josh, you have any sort of final comments, um, final thoughts to share? Yeah, this is James. I wanted to uh, thank both my colleagues today. It's been, um, it's been great working with both companies. Um, we look forward to um, growing with them and, and developing more products uh, together and uh, really want to thank uh, the audience participation and, and all of the great questions and um, and congratulate everyone who's who's part of making you know these great discoveries and and we want to continue to be your basis for breakthroughs so um, let us know how we can help thanks james yeah, thanks just, everybody just yeah, thanks. Uh, from my perspective, I just echo uh, what James said. It's been really great to work with Eldevron and, you know, anybody that has worked with them, you know, they, they always seem to get fantastic uh, service. So we're really pleased to be part of the uh, partnership and it's really great just to see gene therapy working so successfully. So, yeah, thank you. Great. Okay. Well, in that case, um, I will also extend my thanks um, to you, James and Ryan and Josh, and to everyone who has participated today. Uh, we've covered some really critical points uh, and some, um, some potential bottlenecks as well. So um, just to let everybody know as well, this webinar is available on demand um, if you need to refer back to it um, or, or, or share it with your colleagues, etc. cetera. Um, I will send everybody a link to the recording um, later on this afternoon. So look out for that. Um, and also just to let everybody know, if you want to um, hear about you know, other webinars, discussions covering these sorts of issues, um, please head over to Facilitate Exchange and um, uh, sign up to the newsletter and, and just have a look at the other content that is going on and the conversations that are going on as well. Um, but once again, thank you very much, everyone. And um, good afternoon, good evening.